nervous system. And nerves use electrical signals to communicate. So we need to learn a little bit about how electricity in the cell happens. It's not really the same as what we think of electricity and wiring in our home. We're not moving electrons. We're going to be moving charged ions. So let's take a minute to look at how membrane potentials are generated and what they are, because they will be very important in neurons and in muscle cells. So like all cells, neurons have a resting membrane potential. One of the differences between neurons and other cells is that they can rapidly change that membrane potentials, which makes neurons highly excitable, and that's why we say they carry out their functions using electrical signals. That electrical signal is changing membrane potentials. So Whenever opposite charges are together, they are attracted to one another. Positives attracted to negatives, negatives attract to positive. So if you want to keep those apart, you're going to need to use energy to keep uh, the positives away from the negatives. And in this case, we're talking about a cell, so the place we want to keep them apart from is the membrane have more negatives on the inside of the cell, more positives on the outside of the cell in general. That requires energy to keep that, and when you allow the negatives to move towards the positives or the positives to move toward the negatives, you release energy. So when opposite charges are separated, the system will have potential energy, and that's what we're talking about here. In a resting cell, there is a potential electrical energy between the outside of the cell and just inside the membrane. So we need some definitions to help us uh, explain and understand these concepts. The first would be voltage. That potential energy that you generate by separating charges, the difference between two sides of the membrane, uh, is going to be called voltage. And it's measured in two different points, uh, outside and inside. Volts would be a very big number for us to use in biology, so we use millivolts. Uh, and it's really the potential difference or potential, uh, the charge difference across the plasma membrane gives us this potential, this voltage. The greater the charge difference between those two points, the higher the voltage. When electricity is allowed to move between two points uh, and in our home we use electrons and wires but in cells we're going to be using ions when we move that positives towards the negatives we get a current flowing that current can be used to do work so flow is going to be dependent on the current is going to be dependent on the voltage how much of a difference there is and resistance, how much that whatever it is, in this case the cell membrane, provides for resistance. So resistance is going to be a hindrance to the flow of charges. And that means there are a couple of different general things that uh, can we can use to describe resistance. An insulator would be a substance with a high electrical resistance. It's difficult for charges to flow through insulators. And we've talked about the myelin sheath being an insulator for nerves. The second thing you can be is a conductor. A conductor doesn't interfere with the flow of electrical resistance. It allows the current to flow. So we've got a voltage, the difference between two points, when that difference, uh, when those charges are allowed to move, current will flow, and that current is going to encounter resistance, and the resistance can either be in the form of an insulator or a conductor. The law that describes this relationship that we've hinted at here is called Ohm's Law, and Ohm's Law states that uh, current, which we use I uh, as an abbreviation for, is equal to the voltage divided by the resistance. What that means for us is current is going to be directly proportional to voltage. More voltage, more current. More current, more voltage. So the greater the 
voltage, the potential difference, the greater the current. There is no net current flow between points with the same potential. So there's no movement if you have the same potential on both sides, similar to our diffusion. Current is going to be inversely proportional to resistance, which means if resistance goes up, current goes down. So our membrane uh, is going to be an insulator, but within that membrane there are going to be channels, and those are going to be ion channels. Those ion channels will serve as conduits. They will allow uh, charged particles to move through them under appropriate conditions. The ones where really, uh, I, actually, they are very selective before I get into that. Uh, so a potassium channel will only allow potassium through, a sodium channel will only allow sodium through. Those are the two major channels uh, we're going to deal with, the uh, two ions we'll deal with. And there are two major types of ion channels. The first is a leakage channel. It's a non-gated channel. It's always open. And that type of ion, potassium or sodium, will move through that leakage channel uh, in response to uh, ion gradients, some to electrical gradients. There will always be some leakage. The other types of channel that are very important to us uh, are gated channels. In a gated channel, you can't get through that channel until it is opened. So the gate refers to the opening and closing of that channel. There are three ways, three major ways that these channels have control their gates, control whether they're open or closed, and that is chemically, voltage gated, or mechanically gated. So in a chemically gated we'll also call a ligand gated channel. When one chemical binds to that gate, it opens. And that allows the flow of whatever ion that gate is specific for. This is what we we'll use when we talk about neurotransmitters. In a voltage gated channel, when the membrane potential changes, when you start having uh, current flowing through, you will open and or close the channel based on that current. And mechanically gated channels open and close in response to physically changing the shape of the receptor. And some of our sensory receptors are going to work that way. So in a chemically gated channel, it's normally closed. There's no receptor bound to it. Now a neuron somewhere releases a neurotransmitter, that neurotransmitter binds to that lock, and that lock opens the gate, and now sodium and potassium pass through. Uh, Voltage-gated channels, as long as the voltage is the resting membrane potential, it's closed. If you change that resting membrane potential, that opens the channel. So when gated channels are open, ions diffuse quickly. They move along their chemical concentration gradients from higher to lower concentrations, and they move along their electrical gradients, so they'll move towards opposite charges. So if there's a lot of sodium outside the cell, very little sodium inside the cell, sodium has a positive charge. When you open a sodium channel, the sodium is going to rush in to try to equalize the amount of sodium and in addition to that, the cell is going to have a negative charge compared to outside the cell. So you're also sending sodium in to try to find that negative charge. So there are two forces pulling it in that direction. An electrochemical gradient is when we look at those two things at the same time. The electrical and chemical gradients combine. Uh, and that's where we get an ion flow. That ion flow creates an electrical current, and as the voltage changes across the membrane, we can rearrange it, express it with Ohm's law. So if we want to predict the voltage we can get, we would take the current times the resistance. So we can measure this potential difference across the membrane using 
uh, uh, instrument called a voltmeter. And what we would get in a cell that is not being stimulated is a resting membrane potential. And a resting membrane potential of a neuron is approximately minus, minus 70 millivolts. That means the cytoplasmic side of that membrane is negatively charged uh, and charged to a potential of minus 70 millivolts compared to the outside. The actual voltage difference can vary from minus 40 to minus 90, uh, but because there's a difference between the negative inside, positive outside, that membrane is said to be polarized. So in a resting membrane potential, a membrane is polarized. That potential difference is differences in the ionic concentration of the intracellular fluid and the extracellular fluid. There are also differences in the permeability of the plasma membrane to different materials. Together, that helps us generate this resting membrane potential. So here is an art. Whoops! What I do? Here's an artist's rendition of what a voltmeter might look like. There's a probe inside the cell, a probe outside the cell, and the difference in charge between those two is minus 70 millivolts. It's minus inside, plus outside. The ion composition, the extracellular fluid, has a higher concentration of sodium than the intracellular fluid. Uh, that's balanced by chloride ions. The intracellular fluid has more potassium than the extracellular fluid, and that plus charge is balanced out by proteins. Most proteins have a slightly negative charge to them. So potassium is going to play the most important role in membrane potential, although it's going to be the flow of sodium we'll be following a lot. So in a resting membrane, we generate that resting potential because of the differences in sodium and potassium inside and outside the cell, sodium outside, potassium in, and the difference in permeability to the membrane to sodium and potassium. The plasma membrane itself is impermeable to large anionic proteins. So proteins don't pass through the membrane. Proteins are inside the cell, they stay there, and they have a slight negative charge. It is slightly permeable to sodium. There are leakage channels. The sodium doesn't go directly through the membrane, but there are sodium leakage channels. And sodium will diffuse into the cell down its concentration gradient because there's more sodium outside the cell than inside the cell. But it's 25 times more permeable to potassium than it is to sodium, and that's because there are more leakage channels for potassium. So potassium tends to diffuse out of the cell down its concentration gradient. Uh, the cell is very permeable to chloride ions, which are minus charges. So there's more potassium diffusing out than sodium diffusing in. Combined with the fact that there are negatively charged proteins in the cell, this results in the cell having uh, being more negative. Uh, and that is how we establish the resting membrane potential. The sodium-potassium pump is going to help stabilize that resting membrane potential. That helps maintain the concentration gradients for sodium and potassium, more sodium outside, more potassium inside. And that's partly because there are three sodiums pumped out and two potassiums pumped in using a sodium-potassium ATPase. And we have looked at this before. Uh, three sodiums bind to their combining site, opens the cell up, and then two, so two potassiums bind to theirs, and that's uh, put into the cell. So membrane potential can change if the concentration of ions across the membranes changes uh, or if the membrane permeability changes. And we are going to change membrane permeability by activating channels for sodium and potassium. Those changes in the resting membrane potential can produce two types of signals. A graded potential, 
which is just covering a short distance, just around the place where it initially starts, or a self-propagating long distance signal, which we'll call an action potential. So if we can get enough of a graded potential, we can generate an action potential. And an action potential is what we refer to as a neuron firing. So changes in membrane potential are going to be used as signals that help to receive information from uh, sensory neurons, send information in motor neurons, and integrate inf information between the neurons. So we have some terms to help us describe that, uh, membrane potential changes that are relative to the resting membrane potential. So the resting membrane potential, we said, was about minus 70. So depolarization would decrease the membrane potential. Move towards zero. Remember, we're talking negative numbers, so it, uh, it doesn't get bigger. It actually gets smaller. So inside the membrane becomes less negative, uh, and that's how we get impulses and the closer we get to the thresholds the easier it is to get those impulses. The opposite of that is hyperpolarization and we will see this uh, in the process of neurons working. Hyperpolarization means to make the membrane potential greater so the inside will become more negative uh, and that means you have to overcome that difference before you can get depolarization for either a graded or a uh, action potential. All right, I'm going to stop there for this video because I think there's some pretty complex stuff in there about resting membranes. And the next video we'll pick up here and we'll learn about graded potentials, which will lead to action.